Good morning, everybody. It's been three weeks. Three weeks since I've had an opportunity to be up here with you guys. People got sick, conferences, things like that. But here I am, ready to be with you guys again this morning. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to the book of John. We have been going through the book of John chapter by chapter. We will continue that. It's just been a lot of fun to hear from different speakers as well and just kind of learn from others. And Sam and Sarah have been up here really leading us in such a fun way. Uh, I get to uh, grab on just to the baton from where they've been and, and continue to take us into the rest of John. So John chapter 10 is where we're going to be this morning. Um, before we get started, I just want to remind us, this... Um, this whole series started in chapter one, the thesis of, of Jesus, uh, um, or excuse me, of John reminding us and telling us, hey, I'm about to go into a book. I'm going to describe to you why Jesus is divine, that he claimed he was divine, that he claimed he was the Messiah. And then, and then the rest of the chapters that we've been covering going back and forth has been the gospel just displayed for you and for me. For you and for me to be able to see the testimony that Jesus gave to himself, that others gave about Jesus himself. He, he, he did a lot of miracles that gave testimony to himself. And John 10 continues that conversation. It continues that argument for us. Now, um, right at the beginning of John 10, I'm not even going to read it because we're going to be covering it in such a really fun, cool way. It's like Jesus is start. Remember, he's being surrounded by people. People are starting to follow him. He's done all kinds of miracles. He just healed a blind man with mud and spit. Remember that? That was super fun. And Sam walked us through that last week, right? And so people are like, they want to know more. They want to learn more. And so he breaks out into uh, uh, telling them a metaphor, right? And he's talking about a shepherd. And he's talking about sheep. And he breaks it down in just a few verses. And it it probably looked like this, where after he was done explaining it, people were like, mm, I don't get what you're saying. So he has to break it down even more. So I'm not even going to read the first few verses, because basically he tells, he, 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 uh, he tells uh, the example, and then he breaks it down even more. Okay, so we're just going to start right off the bat in verse 7. Say, I got it if you got it. All right, so let's, let's, let's read the first few verses, and, and, we'll, and we'll dive in. Verse 7, so Jesus uh, again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, remember we've been teaching you that idea of truly, truly, that original thought that originated with God. It's another uh, uh, word for amen, except that on the, instead of the back end of a, of a prayer in agreement, it's, uh, Jesus is putting it on the front end, being like, hey, pay attention. Pay attention to what I'm, what I'm about to say, what's coming out of my mouth you've never heard before. It actually originated with me, okay? And so pay attention. Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, Robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. So here's, if you're titling this message, if you want to start jotting down notes, which we encourage you to do that in here, we just sung a song about how good God is, about how good Jesus is. Sometimes that word just can get super diluted because you used it last night with the tacos you ate. Those were good tacos, right? Or maybe you're gonna, you went to a Halloween party. You're like, that was a good party or, or, or clue night. That was a, a good event. We use good all the time. We throw it all over the place. And then we come in here and we, re, we, we do a, a song and we use the word good over and over and over and over again. And before you know it, you're like, good, good, good. Like, what does it mean? It's, it's, in a way, it loses its meaning. And so I just want to kind of bring us back to that, that beautiful word and what it means. And when, when I use it here, there's a depth to it. Because we're not just using it like that was a good steak. We're talking about the ultimate word of what good is being applied to God. The other day, a buddy of mine sent me a message and said, hey, how do you know that you know God? It's like, it's a great question, you know? And I directly went to what I know about God. And so that's kind of what I want to get, lead us into this morning. I want to just remind you more about who Jesus is. I want to bring some more truth because this is what Jesus does in this next passage. Let me tell you more about who I am. Here he is for only a certain amount of time on earth, and he's going to reveal himself over and over and over and over again. He's going to give testimony to who he is over and over and over again, and this is no different. 
So if you're titling this, put on here, more of who Jesus is. More of who Jesus is. Because that's what we're going to dive into this morning. Give me more of who Jesus is. Because that in and of itself is going to pour into me being able to regularly and over and over again be able to say, Jesus is good. He's really good. How do you know that? Well, let me tell you more of who Jesus is. That feeds into that definition of goodness. So right off the bat here, he tells us something fun. He's using this metaphor of, of a shepherd. He's using this metaphor of sheep, this metaphor of, 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 of a holder of sheep. So back in the day, it was known that there would be these kind of uh, courtyard, there were sheep folds. They were called sheep folds, okay? And there was, it was almost like this, uh, this brook, this uh, brook, <laughs> this brick wall, this fold that would be near homes or, or, or connected to a home. It wasn't just necessarily for that home, but maybe multiple homes would hold their sheep there. It would sometimes have a door, but not always have a door. So somebody would have to stand at the door and keep the sheep in there from wanting to run in and run out, right? Like, for example, in my home, I have a dog. His name is Bruce. He's a multi-poo. He's maybe 11.5 pounds soaking wet, maybe, right? He's tiny. So when I go outside in my front yard and I yell for him, it's super awkward to yell Bruce for a name that maybe should belong to a 50-pound dog, right? And then here comes this little guy, right? And men across the street stare at me super weird. It's like, it's fine, guys. Yes, this is my dog, Bruce, right? So any time I open the front door, Bruce is like this. He's ready to go. I have to stand there. If I don't stand there, he will bolt out of there and get lost and get eaten Huh, that might not be a bad thing. But I'm just saying, I know, I know. I love my dog, I promise. So I have to protect it. Wow, dog lovers, okay. It, you guys are ready to cancel me already. Relax. Okay, I would never do that, obviously. But I have to stand there, and he will stand there right at the door. The door will be open, and he knows not to run out. He has to stay there, right? This is kind of similar type of a situation that was going on here with these sheep. When they came in and they were inside of the sheepfold, they had to stay there and they had to be there. So Jesus understands that the people who are listening to him understand this idea because they grew up this way, okay? Many of them were probably working with sheep. Many of them had sheep in order to be able to survive in this world, okay? So he goes there to use this example and he starts applying it to himself, okay? You want to know more about me? You want to understand more about me? I'm going to use language you can understand, okay? And so in this sheepfold, not only am I at the door, I am the door. That's the first thing he drops. I am the door. Already, if you're growing up in Jewish time, there's all kinds of language here that could be understood, right? We We did a whole series on the tabernacle not long ago, right? We talked about how there was only one way into the tabernacle, only one way to get to worship God, to be able to confess your sins. Right here, right now, Jesus is saying, hey, I am the only way. I'm the only way. You have to come to me. You have to come through me. In these last few chapters, he's consistently telling them, you're not understanding. You're not wanting to believe truth. You have to believe. Uh, The truth is actually staring you right in the face. And this is what he's telling them. And right off the bat, Right there, I am the door. He says it twice. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. I love this. Because right, right away, there's a little bit of a, of, of a comparison kind of go, going on that there are, there are those who kind of have come before me, have tried to maybe lead you astray. Because remember, there's this battle going on regularly with religious leaders and himself, right? They're telling people one thing. He's, in a way, telling them another thing, right? People have come before me, and they're just thieves and robbers. And in fact, in verse 10, it's going to get into, like, there is a real enemy, There's a real enemy who wants to take you out. He's a robber. He's a thief. He wants to actually take your life. That is not who I am. If you come to me, if you come through the door, if you come through me, look what he says. You will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. I love that. 
That God doesn't, Jesus, listen, Jesus does, doesn't just leave us giving ourselves to him, us trusting him in that space. It just leaves it alone, which a lot of leaders, a lot of people out there, that's what, that's actually what they're saying. When they say, follow me, they say, fall in line. That's what they say, fall in line. If we keep going with this scenario of the, of the sheepfold, it's like, a leader of the world says, hey, get in the sheepfold, shut up. Don't do anything. I got this. It's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying, look, you want to come to me. I'm the way. When you're in here, I'm protecting you. But look, what, what did it say next? You're able to do what? What did it say? Go back to the verse. That's right. Go into free pasture. You can actually come in and out, right? Let's come back to uh, my story with Bruce. Stinking dog. He gives me so many stories. So it's like this understanding. Bruce knows if my master is at the door, I stay inside. Now, when he was little, he tried to fight me on that. But now he gets it. But as soon as I walk outside and I'm out there and I look back at him, he knows free range. And this guy bolts, but he never goes too far. He just goes far enough because he knows we've, we've, we've trained for this. Okay. He knows I better, my master better be able to see me again. When he was little, he would like totally go to the edge. And before he was gone, I'm like, get your butt back here. But here's what I envision. Oh, I envision us when Jesus is saying you can come in and out. I envision us like Bruce where it's like, wait, we can go outside. Yeah. You can, you can come in and out. And when I say go to Bruce, I said, Bruce, come on. He gallops, like he jumps through the air and is running through the grass and he just takes off. And I'm like, this dog is so stinking happy right now. He's literally like, like it's like if I could slow mo it, right? Where they like, like they, they are running and they just kind of like are in the air, like all paws are in the air. Like that's why I see Bruce just like, <laughs> right? And he's just gone right? That's literally what I envision when I read this verse, that you and I, we're not held captive. We're not held prisoners. Under the protection of Jesus, under the protection of, of, of Christ, he has saved us so that now we can run free. We can be on green pastures just like Bruce. It's like, let's go in every part of our lives, that we don't have to feel like we're prisoners, but we can actually, actually walk in freedom. He's saying, I am the door. I am the way. You have to come through me. And in that, you will be saved. And in that, you will be able to come in and out and be free, truly free. That's what he's saying to these guys. It's beautiful. Look at 11. Oh, sorry. Look at the rest of 10. Right? Because the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. There is a, can I just remind you of something? Sometimes we turn really inward or we turn toward our parents or we turn toward our friends and we realize, oh, life can just suck and just so much sin and all these issues and all these problems. I don't get it. I don't, we get to this place where I don't understand. <laughs> can I just remind you why? Because there is a real enemy after you out there. He's real. And look at what, according to this passage, He's a thief. He wants to sneak into your life. I don't know how many thieves you ran into, hopefully not many, but I don't know how many thieves you've heard of at four o'clock in the afternoon, walk through the front door of a house or a store and say, hey, I'm a thief. I'm ready to take all your stuff. That's the worst thief, right? No, thieves are sneaky. They come usually in the dark. They come usually where you won't expect them. And before you know it, you've been robbed. And there's a real thief who wants to rob you of your life, of your freedom, ultimately of your soul. So there's a real enemy on the other end is what I'm reminding you of right now. And it, he sa and it says, what is, he, what is he coming for? Just to bug your life? Just to be like a pebble in your shoe? Nope. To steal and kill and destroy. Holy smokes, that got 
that got ugly real fast, right? Sometimes we don't even think about that. We don't even realize that, that that's really what's going on around us. Look at 11, or sorry, the back end of 10. The thief comes to do that, but here's what I come to do. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Back to that idea of free range. Does this mean you just go do whatever the heck you want? Sin however much you want? Hurt people as much as you want? No. Jesus says, hey, you come hand in hand with me. You let myself reveal myself to you. Put my spirit in you. You will walk in true freedom. And not just true freedom, in abundance of life. Abundance. This doesn't mean you get everything you want. This doesn't mean you're just super, super duper rich. That's not what that means. You're going to be rich, maybe. Literally, that would be awesome. And if you get rich, hey, don't forget the little people. You know what I'm saying? But what I'm saying is like truly abundant and rich in your soul, in your life, in who you are, the depth of who you are, that's, that is priceless. I work with people regularly who have, I, I, I work with people who have like great jobs or have a good amount of money and some of them are miserable. There's not abundance of life going on at the depth of who they are because they've not put their life in Jesus. They've climbed the hill. They've climbed the mountain. I mean, how many sport figures do we see literally, according to our world, have everything from afar, and yet they're miserable? What's that all about? So that's not what Jesus is talking about. Like, no, I, I'm going to complete and give you wholeness within you. And you need me. That's what you need. 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. What else do we, are we, what are we learning about, about Jesus here? That he is a good shepherd. He is a good shepherd. It's ownership versus a hired hand here. The hired hand does not care for the sheep. He doesn't know the sheep. He's there just to get paid is what he's saying. That's not who I am. I am the owner type of mentality where you mean the world to me. You mean life to me. If you went back into the first century and you, and, and you owned, you know, a hundred sheep, that is your livelihood. You die, your kids die, your, 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 your loved ones die if you lose your sheep. Like if they got sick and all died, you're in trouble. You're in real trouble. As an owner, you get up in the morning, you make sure they're okay, you make sure the wolves aren't, aren't near, you make sure that they're, that, that, that they're healthy. You watch over them, right? Oh, this is going to get weird. Just for a second. Just follow me for a second. I'm trying to show you the intensity, okay, of owning something. Anybody slept through their alarm this morning? Okay. <laughs> Hannah. Okay. Okay. Anybody slept through the alarm this last week? Okay. Let me go even deeper. Anybody push snooze on their alarm this week? Okay, great. For all, the, all of you guys who raise your hand, those who didn't, you're like, I'm perfect, it's fine. Okay, take it to another level. Let's say, let's say tomorrow morning your alarm went off. And if you don't push snooze and you get up right when your alarm goes off, I give you a million dollars. Would you get up? How many would get up? How many would get up? How many would push snooze still? Because you don't care about a million dollars. Nobody, right? What did I just shift for you? Your mindset, your ownership of the situation. Heck yeah, I'll get up for a million dollars. I'm, I'm going to set up like 10 alarms before my main alarm just so I can make sure I get up. You see the difference? You see the difference? It's what's going on here. A hired help pushes snooze, man. They don't care. Jesus is like, 
That's not who I am towards you. I'm taking ownership of this. I love you. I see you. I know you. In fact, I laid down my life for you. That's how much I care about you, that I'm willing to do that. When it gets dark and lonely, when a wolf shows up, when the shame shows up, when uncertainty wants to consume your time, the good shepherd doesn't flee. He doesn't run away because he doesn't care or it's not his problem. He stays. He stands. He stands in front of you and protects you because that's how much you and I matter to him. And he's, he's telling us, that's what good of a shepherd I am. The next thing he tells us in the next verse is that Jesus knows his own and they know him. Look at 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the father knows me. And then I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I love this. My kids know daddy's voice. I guarantee you, I can line up 10 men up here and I can blindfold them in the back of the room and have all of them call Owen. And I guarantee you, Owen will not move a muscle unless I call him, if that was the game. Owen, blindfold you, only move and come in this direction when you hear daddy call you. Done, that's easy. And I'll give you a million dollars. I'm handing out a million dollars today, people, apparently. I don't have them, but I'm just saying. Right? He'd be like, down, dad, I'm in. You know, that's easy game. Why is that an easy game? Why? Because he knows me and he knows my voice. He's heard it since he was young. He's not gonna be like, ooh, I wonder if I know who my dad is. Nope. And I believe that's what Jesus is talking about here. I know you and you know me because I have called you. I have not forced you toward me. Think about that for a second, that tenderness and that love that God has there. Jesus doesn't force us toward him. He's called us to him. And then we respond. And in that beautiful relationship with him, he's talking, to, uh, he's using intimacy language here. I mean, look at this. I'm good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Here it is. Here's the intimacy language that he compares us to. Our relationship with his and the father. Just as the father knows me, I'm sorry. Do you believe that the father knows his son, Jesus? Very intimately. Before the creation of time. And Jesus is using that relationship to compare what our relationship should be with him. That's incredible. That's so intimate. That's so connected. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life uh, for the sheep. Like this is the type of, of death. Intimacy like his and the Father have. Listen, you guys, this is so important to understand because again, it'll lead to that place of really seeing how good he is. Jesus did not come for us out of charity. Okay? As much as you may think that. We were in trouble, so he has to come get us, I guess. Oh, he had nothing to do that century, so I guess he'll come save us. No, we weren't charity to him. Again, I go back to my kids. One day you might have kids, but think of a loved one in your life. If, one, if a loved one in your life was snatched from your guys' world and taken away, would you go try to save them and help them out of charity? Would you? If someone took my children away from me, I'm not going to put up posters and maybe call the cops out of charity for my kids. No, it's because I love them so much, I'm going to go get them back. Because that's how intimately we know and love one another. I care for them that much. That's what God did for us. That's what Jesus did for us. This, that's the type of crazy intimate language that he's using here that show us the depth of his love for us. That word no in there is intimate language. We fully know him, he fully knows us. That's the connectivity. 
And we get to know him because of him, because he calls us. He gives us faith to believe. Here's the next one. Jesus lays down his life for his people. That's something else we know about Jesus. Jesus is willing to lay down his life for his people. He says it right there at the end of 15. I lay down my life for the sheep. Again, go back to the same scenario with my kids. Easy. If it was legit that someone said to me, either Noah lives or you live, pick. Not even a question. Done. I'll give my life. I believe that's part of why God even allows us to have kids, to kind of, kind of sense that depth. But that's, that's, that's the way Jesus sees us. <laughs> He's literally saying this to the crowd. Hey, this whole metaphor that I keep talking about, the sheep and the shepherd and the protection and the coming in and the coming out, you know, see all that? Let me go to an extra mile for you. Have you guys ever heard of a shepherd who literally lays down their life for their sheep? The crowd would have been like, what, for a stinky sheep? That's stinky, that's gross. Like, I get it, you gotta live on it, but to die, to give up your life, they would have been like, but he's saying, I'm willing to do that. Man, and if they're reading between the lines and the spirit is really setting them in the space, they're like, this guy is saying he's willing to die for us. What the heck is he saying? Upside down thinking, upside down language here. So cool. And again, it would have echoed their forefathers, right? David raised sheep. He worked, he, like he faced lions and bears for his sheep. Oh my, right? Like he did those things. You think about Moses. He led his people in the wilderness. Jesus is echoing these two, but he's better because David actually never fully laid down his life for his, his sheep. And Moses had to lead them through the wilderness because of his boneheadness. And he didn't even make it into the promised land. Go read that another time, right? They did, he did it. So Jesus is like David and Moses, but better. That's what he's echoing here. Is what he's saying here. Is what we're learning about him. 16, Jesus says, and I have other sheep, oh boy, that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. There was a major, major division between Gentiles and Jews. And Jews were convinced the Messiah is only coming for us because we're his people for hundreds of years. We've known that. We've understood that. Prophecy talks about that. And Jesus just, again, upside down language. Actually, there's people out there who I'm going to bring back in. I'm going to bring toward me. You may think they don't even belong here, but I'm going to go get them. Jesus is making one flock. He's one shepherd over one flock. And this is where he's combining both Gentiles and Jews, already talking about that mixture that's going to, that is going to happen. Because here's why. Here's another thing we learned about Jesus. Jesus is concerned for the lost. He's concerned for the lost. He came for everyone, not just Jews, not just those who think they're perfect, not just those who were supposedly keeping the law. He came for all. And you know that whole saying that Jesus left the 99 for the one, right? You've heard that before. Sometimes you can be like, why is he leaving me for that one person? Are they better than me? Nope. It's because of this idea. If you're among the flock, if you're among the 99, you fully have him always. His protection is always there. And the beauty about Jesus is that he's everywhere. <laughs> so when he's going after the one, his presence is still with us. That's the type of God we serve. So yes, Jesus, go get the one. Go get the millions that need you. And how can we help instead of wine? like the older brother in, in the lost son story. We have him always. Another thing we learn about Jesus in the next verses is this. Jesus has full authority, full authority. What kind of authority? Like in the way that he's just bossy? Nope. Watch this. This, this right here shows 
how much authority Jesus has over all. Because if you can have authority over this, everything else is a piece of cake. Look at this, 17. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it back up. This charge I have received from my Father. Literally, Jesus is saying, hey, I, I give up my life in death, and guess what? I can raise it up again. He's saying all kinds of crazy things in the eyes of these people who are listening. Because you're going to see the response in just a second. It wasn't the best. But he's literally saying, I have control over life. Fully. I can literally die if I want to. And I can raise it back up if I want to. People are like, what? This is like X-Men stuff. <laughs> You know what, can I just do a side note, interesting real quick? It's interesting how like obsessed our society is about superheroes, like obsessed, right? And superpowers and all the things. And, we, and it's like one of the things that we talk about when we like meet each other. If you had a superpower, which one would it be, right? Or if you could be a superhero, which one would you be? Like we're so into it, right? I mean, look at the bazillions of dollars that are made off of superheroes, comics and movies, right? Yet, when we really talk about a real superhero, Someone who has incredible power, like Jesus? <laughs> nah, that's not a thing. How could that ever be a thing? I can't wrap my head around it, so it must not be true. I'm just saying, run with that for a second. Why are we so obsessed with that stuff? Here we have Jesus who has incredible power and authority. Let's keep going because I'm running out of time. In 19 and 21, we see their response. People freak. There was, again, a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, he has a demon, right? I mean, you would probably think that about me here, right? If I could tell you that I could fly, or like, I could fly, or I can die right now if I want to, and then I can live myself back up from death. You'd be like, bye, right? Like, it'd be weird, right? And so they're freaking out. Many of them said, he has a demon and is insane, you would probably say that about me too. Why listen to him? But others said, there are, these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Meaning, in the very crowd among him, the very words that he's saying, some are going to hear me. Some are going to hear my voice. Some are going to know me. Some are not. It's happening right in front of them. Literally, there's a divide happening. Some are like, oh, I can't hear this. This is gross. This is disgusting. This makes no sense. This guy's insane. And on the other side, people are like, I feel full. I can see. My, my, my heart can see. This is truth. I hear the voice. I hear God's voice. This is legitimate. He's not possessed. He can't have a demon in him. He's bringing us life. And that's how people respond to the gospel, to the good news. Even in this very room, some of you are like, this is stupid. Sorry. Some of you are like, whoa, hold on a second. There's something about this. And I can't even fully wrap my head around. But it seems to be calling me. I would listen to that. Let's keep moving because, again, we're out of time here. I obviously have not preached in some time because I got things to say. Eventually, the rest of this chapter, if I can sum it up, which, my goodness, so much there. Jesus takes it to talking about how the intimacy and the connection between him and the Father. You know, he's telling them, like, man, you're not getting it. Because they come out and they're like, well, we don't fully understand. Can you just tell us? And he's like, oh, my gosh. Have I not shown you enough? Like, he's telling them, have you not seen the signs? It's like they want more and more and more. Which, by the way, that's why Jesus came and did those, these miracles and did these signs for humanity, for us to see and to believe. Which just battles our thinking sometimes today, you guys, where you're like, if Jesus would just rip the sky open and tell me he's real, I would believe. Would you, though? And if you did, for how long? For how long? Before you would just go on doing whatever you want anyway. Because that's our nature. This is why we will keep coming back to the gospel here in your life, in this room. 
Because you and I are extremely forgetful. If we saw humanity for hundreds of years, literally see God, God split the sky, talk about himself, show himself in Jesus, in miracles, in testimony, and going to the cross, and still people didn't believe. Who are we to say, if only this, if only he did that, if only he showed up this way, then I would believe. No, you're not. Get over it. You're not going to. Jesus did the thing. He's telling them, I came. What else do you want me to do? I've literally shown myself to you. But you don't truly want to hear, do you? And the God of the universe still did that. Twenty-seven. My sheep heard my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I'll end with this. Just not my ending, but we'll see what happens. Do you know God's voice? Have you responded? to God's voice. We can know it's his voice by going here. Start here. Read the things we're talking about and we're discovering right here. Because on and off again, God is regularly bringing himself to the center stage in 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 these messages saying, how will you respond how will you respond? I'm here. I'm for you. I'm available to you. You don't have to jump through hoops. You don't have to become the perfect sheep. You don't have to become a shepherd. You literally have salvation in me. And that salvation will bring you in and out in freedom. I mean, I love how it says that you will find pasture. You know what that means? That you will find peace, true peace in him. And he's offering it to us. Not to leave this room and then get to work. No, that's not what I'm inviting you to. I'm inviting you to rest in Jesus. Truly be free, friends. Enough with the stuff at home. Enough with the, with the, with the trial after trial after trial after trying and trying to be this better Christian, this better person, and just continue to walk in shame enough with that. He's saying, I came so that can be taken away. I've already paid for that. That's already done. Now walk in freedom. Come with me. Run like Bruce. The door's open. Have at it. This pastor's mine. I own it. In fact, I'll run by by your side together, have a relationship with you. That's the beauty that he brings to us. And my hope would be that we can live in that. I'll end with this last, last piece. He said another few I am statements. You know, I am the door, he said, right? Meaning he's the resource. He's the provider. He's the protector. He's the classifier. <laughs> he's the one that says, yep, he's mine. She's mine. I'm the shepherd. He is also the owner, meaning. He's meaning that he's also the owner, the one who's personally in with us. Love, mercy, grace, visionary, Lord, leader, protector, defender. You know, massive passage that I didn't get to unpack for us here is that it's so important for us to understand that Jesus is one with the Father because everything he's bringing to us is directly from heaven. And one massive, massive, please look at me. If you didn't hear anything else I said, listen to this, especially if you consider yourself a Christian. He says, now, hopefully you're understanding we're one. And what I'm saying to you, it's coming directly from the Father. He, he says this to, the, to, to them, to us, to the world. Where is it? Let me make sure I find it. Look at verse 29. My Father, who has given them, snooze that thing. Just kidding. Yeah, it's gonna get it. Okay, my Father who has given them, you got a million dollars, there you go. My father, who has given them to me, right? God is working here and bringing us to to himself. 
is greater than all. I love that he drops that line there. Authority language, greater than all. He gets to say this. He gets to have this claim. Look at, look at the claim, especially if you're a Christian. Huge, huge, huge. Because you'll convince yourself of this. The thief will steal this from your, from, from your heart with all kinds of weird thinking. Look at this. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Amen. You know what that means? When you give yourself to Jesus, when you put your trust in Jesus, it is a done deal. In this language Jesus is using, I'm connected to the Father. He's the greatest one who can say this. No one else can say this. When you and I are his, we are his. It's over. It's done with. And may that empower you to run in and out of the sheepfold, meaning life, that the protector is over you. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? Do you hear what I'm saying to you? This should just cause us all kinds of peace and freedom that what you did last night or what you did last week that continues to just cloud over you and bring shame over you doesn't have to be there. Jesus can take that, give it up. Let him and know that the one who has the most power, the most authority, the strongest grip on your soul, if you've put your trust in him, no one is taking you away from him. Jesus, thank you so much for this truth. A lot of info there. May whatever needed to land, land. And may you speak to our hearts continuously into the rest of this week. In your name we pray, amen.